How do you do it? How do you translate and interpret? What is it that you do? It's complex in that you're making lots and lots of decisions very quickly according to many, many points of data. And people do it. And you've probably been doing it for a good many years when you were learning your languages. For example, many of you have been using translation or you were brought up in bilingual homes or you travel. You've been doing these things. It's not a mystery. Language itself is incredibly complex, as is communication. The translation is one extension of those things. I'll talk about what well, some of the questions said. Um, how can I be a good translator and interpreter if I'm not completely bilingual? Okay, I wasn't brought up as a bilingual. Uh, my English or my, my non-German language isn't quite good, or I'm, I'm, I'm a bit weak in this one and stronger in this one. Okay? Here's what I think. A colleague in Monterey came to me and she was uh, interested in the fact that the people who scored best on the final exams. This was actually for conference interpreting, but it applies to written translation as well. Had learnt Japanese late in life. And the people who were brought up in bilingual environments did not score as high on the final exams. And this was in the Japanese program. I thought, well, that's, that's weird. You'd expect bilinguals to be better, right? But no, it wasn't so. And then I went to the Spanish program I spoke with them, and they said, yeah, yeah, we get this all the time. We get people who are brought up bilingually with Spanish and English, and they come in and do a translation exercise, and they fail. They take too long. They can't get it. It's hard for them. This is weird. Uh, and then I started reading around on the um, studies of bilingualism, neuroimaging studies, what part of the brain is activated. Okay, and this research is not conclusive, but there's some evidence that points to the following. People who grow up as uh, symmetric bilinguals, that is, you know, my, my kids speak English with me and, and what does he speak? Catalan with his mum, okay? My 10 year, I have a 10 year old boy, okay? And he's symmetric bilingual. He can do all things in these two languages and he speaks other languages as well, but these two are symmetrical. And the evidence is that you do get two centers in the brain activated. That he has to switch from one place to the other. And that switching is hard. However, if you get asymmetrical bilinguals, where one language is stronger than the other. For example, you're brought up in German and you learn English at the age of 12, 13, 14. When you learn that second language, you learn it as an extension of the database or the activated cells of the first language. So what in fact you're learning are a series of mapping operations. You know, English, it's basically like germ, except for this, 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 and this. And you learn these mapping operations as a way of learning the language. I know it contradicts all the theories we have of communicative language learning or immersion, but I'm sorry, people learn languages late in life and they do it that way. You're using mental translation to learn the foreign language. What happens when you come to do the translation or interpreting? Hey, you activate those same mapping operations that you have acquired. And this would explain why symmetrical bilinguals tend not to make ten notches. It's not a, not a rule. If you're a symmetrical bilingual, there is hope. Don't give up. Okay? But statistically, there seems to be cause to believe that people who learn languages late in life perform better in translation and interpreting. And there is some neuroimaging evidence to back that up. It's not gospel truth, but it's intriguing. So have faith, have hope, and keep with your languages. Okay? Um, certainly in my own experience, I started translating when my foreign languages were quite weak. And my only skill was I was pretty good at writing in English. 
and that got me through. Okay. I've since I've since learned some languages a bit better, mainly by marrying people who speak those languages. But that's, that's another, question. another question about this complex behaviour is: What is the difference between interpreting and translation? Okay, dolmetsch and übersetz, interpreting and written translation. Um, so here's some differences. Well, Dolmetscher is speaking and Übersetz is writing. Spoken to spoken, written to written. Pretty simple, except that a lot of interpreting goes from written to spoken. You do sight interpreting or in court these days you get the transcript coming out and you read, you interpret from the transcript. And uh, you can also go from uh, spoken to written, and that would be a form of translation. So that distinction is not clear anymore because the media are getting mixed up. But basically, that's it. People will tell you that in the booth, when you're a simultaneous interpreter, you've got headphones, you've got technology, you are working simultaneously and that written translators are not working simultaneously, and that's the difference. Yes and no. In the wonderful eye-tracking video that you didn't see, there are moments when this very fast translator who touch types, okay, I've told a tecla, yeah, is reading the source text and typing the target text. So I can find evidence of some simultaneity in written translation. <coughs> Increasing work pressure, time pressure, means that that's likely to be the case. Also, the way simultaneous interpreters work is not like playing the didgeridoo. I don't know, didgeridoo, it's this long stick that Australian indigenous people play and you have to blow out and breathe in at the same time. You can do it. Not me, you. Uh, uh, interpreters are not speaking while they're listening and processing all at the same time. They are making the most of the gaps in discourse. Okay, And they are summarizing discourse, and they are getting the main elements of the incoming message, processing it and putting it out, while maintaining attention to the incoming message. So the actual simultaneity is quite narrow. It does happen that you are speaking, finishing a sentence, and processing something coming in, but mostly you are using the gaps in the discourse. <coughs> when people breathe, or, or and, and, and uh, fal false starts like that are all edited out. This means that if a conference interpreter has a reader a speaker who is reading a text, it's almost impossible to do because there are not the gaps that are part of spoken communication. If you have somebody reading fast, then give up. Yeah? Get the text beforehand, translate it, and then read out the translation. But that sounds terrible. Okay? Uh, so do not be misled by the mysteries of simultaneity. There is no magic there. And a bit of simultaneity exists in uh, written. Don't forget also that interpreting these days is simultaneous, hard, really exciting. I, I love it. I love being in the booth. It's, I get an adrenaline rush. You have to handle high pressure. You have to keep very calm. You have to be really arrogant. To, to not worry about the things you're missing and to say what you're saying as if you were sure it's the gospel truth. Do not tell conference interpreters about this, but it's part of the art, okay? At least in my humble experience. Um, consecutive interpreting is when the speaker speaks and then you, the interpreter, speak. There you are editing. It's normal for the consecutive interpreter's production to be about 30% less in length 
than the incoming speech. So when they're speaking, you, you say, what tremendous memory that interpreter has. You know, the person speaks for three to five minutes, you take notes, and there are systems for taking notes, which these days are quite good, and then you produce this wonderful speech. Nobody seems to notice that your speech is shorter than this. Because you edit it out, you get the main points, you draw the connections between the main points. You improve it enormously by making it shorter. Okay? Uh, and that, that's one thing I'll come back to later about how you learn to do this. The other difference is that because spoken language is linear, once you've made a mistake, you can't rub it out. And written language, you can. Okay? Uh, so you can correct. And this is true. This is a lasting difference. Um, it's true that when conference interpreters in consecutive or simultaneous mode make mistakes, you can and should correct yourself. You, you, they're called repairs. You can say, I misspoke, or the interpreter misspoke, or... X should be Y. You can say that quickly. It's normal, especially with high-risk items. Things that are really important, you're correct. It does happen. But written translation in the age of computers has this extreme luxury of very easy revision and review. So what's happening with written translation is that a lot of the first draft of the translation is done very quickly, or is done with machine translation systems, and then you post-edit it, that is, you correct it, and then you read over the text yourself, that is, you revise it, and if it's for publication, you revise it again and again, and then, if it's according to the European norm that currently enforced for translation companies, you give it to somebody else to review, and they will go over. And so your actual product is more a product of the revision and review process, the correction process, than of the actual draft. And a lot of the work in the industry is going towards that, those revision and review processes, corrections. Okay? Uh, because the initial draft, it's, it's, we're at the stage now with statistical machine translation where it is more economical, that is, faster and terminologically more accurate, to get a machine translation and then post-edit it than to translate from scratch for some language pairs. And both, basically, for your language pairs, in between European languages, yes, we are there now. Don't tell your other teachers that I said that. Okay. So much of possible corrections. The other difference is, yes, Interpreters are paid a lot more than translators per hour. But interpreters who have to get to conferences do not work all the time. And if you have a family, it's hard to travel to get to where conferences are, unless you live in lovely Vienna, where the conferences come to you. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, it's a smaller market. Um, it's for people who are mobile. In general, I'm talking about the interpreting market, conference interpreting, and the pay scales are radically different. On the other hand, interpreting also exists in uh, dialogue interpreting between two people or three uh, in the public service institutions or for uh, immigrant processing, immigrant hearing, immigrant assistance, or asylum seekers uh, in the police. And there you get work for interpreters, it's hard work, it's difficult ethically, you need training for it, and the pay in general in Europe is not very high. So you get differences in the profession. Conference interpreters are well paid, and the job is difficult and demanding, but you're not working all the time. Written translation, technical translation, can be reasonably well paid, and it can be in some cases very highly paid. And at the bottom you get interpreting returning, uh, at a level that is not highly professionalized and is sometimes not highly paid. So there's no general rule there, but we'll talk about this later. Conference interpreting is high pressure. 
But the translation industry these days is the deadlines are getting shorter and there's pressure all over the place, to tell you the truth. Yeah. The more pressure, the more money, by the way. And yes, somebody asked about personalities. I do think it's true. There are some people who love getting in the booth, okay, who love high-pressure work. I do. I get a buzz out of it. It's like you know, extreme sports. Huh? And other people who are really comfortable hiding behind the screen to do the translation. Don't, don't, don't send a real person to me. Let me work on the linguistic problem. And they're very happy doing that, and they can be quite successful. So there are definite personality types. Try everything. That's my one recommendation. I think everybody should try interpreting. Everybody should do the oral mode. Everybody should try the written translation and see what you're happy doing. Uh, your body will tell you. When students begin translation and interpreting, they tend to get hung up on what could be called primitive literalism. That is, they think the text that comes in, if they're in the booth or that's on the page, is the key. And it's useful to remember that everything can always be different. Everything that can be said can be said differently. There's always another possibility of saying something. There's always other expressions that can be found. We can... What the hell is this? We can find different ways to get the same effect. Oh, and then it's supposed to go into a song which goes, anything you can say, I can say better. I can say anything better than you. Yes, you can. No, you can't. Yes, you can. No, you can't. Okay. The, the, it's from a, a musical called Annie Get Your Gun. Horrible show, but it's got this nice song about two people saying they can... Anything that's in that text could be otherwise. There is reformulation in language. It's one of the things that natural languages allow us to do. We can say the same thing over and over and over. Teachers know this. You know, it, you get the power, if you read the PowerPoint of this lesson, it will take you about six minutes. And you come and sit through it for an hour and 20 minutes. And you say, what was this guy talking about for an hour and 20 minutes when the content is only this much? It's obvious. I'm saying the same thing over and over. Why would anybody do that? Because you learn. You get to know it. Okay. Anyway, language allows reformulation. This means that whatever's in the text could have been otherwise. So if you change it by using those transformative solutions I gave you last week, don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. You're probably doing something that the author could have put there anyway. And this is one of the main liberating lessons to get across. Anything you can say, I can say better. I can say anything better than you. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Okay. At the beginning, people feel guilty about translation because they're aware of the gaps and the shifts that come in between languages. After a while, you get used to that and you rejoice in it. You find in it a source of creativity. Now, did I present this to you? What does a translation decision look like then? For any start text, Ausgangstext, AT, okay, that comes in, if it's a translation problem, and this for me includes interpreting now, you can quickly generate possible ways of saying it in the target language. TT1, TT2, TT3. I can do all them. All right? And then, because you're a great translator or interpreter, you select one very quickly. That one. Okay? Quickly and with justified ethical confidence. 
Now, I told you there are no rules. Didn't I tell you there were no rules? Okay, so if there is a rule, it's not a translation problem. It's a terminology problem or a grammar problem. You know, learn terminology or learn grammar. If it's a translation problem, you have to select one, and you've got to know what, why, and how, and you've got to do it quickly. If there's reformulation and you accept reformulation, you generate that generative side of your skills is quick. And one of the important things that we teach you here, hopefully, is this creativity, this capacity to generate possible translations. The really hard thing these days is the selection process. Which one do you pick when there are no rules? Back in the day, before the internet, the generation was really hard. It was so hard finding information to generate those things. Now the problem is a reverse. You have so much information, you get so many possible translations quickly, the selection process is what's hard. How do you select? Well, there are some tricks. One, if it's easy, do it. Save your effort. Beginners work too hard on the most banal problems. Professionals go quickly over low-risk problems or problems that are not important. If it says lion and you know that's lerva, put lerva. Unless there's a good reason to think, oh, what kind of lion? Is it a man lion or a girl lion or, uh, I don't know, a figurative lion? Is it a statue? doesn't And that kind of basic literalism goes through form-form transfer between European languages. You're fine and it's efficient. Don't stay there, though, because you will soon make a mistake or run into a big problem that you can't solve. And you get mapping solutions of the kind you had when you were learning languages, all right? Spanish says, se dice que, se dice, in Italian as well. And that's a reflexive verb. Uh, uh, to itself says, hmm? I don't know, se dice que Barça ganaro de maravilla ayer. Basically, it said that Barcelona Football Club won magnificently last night against Real Madrid. You've got to appreciate the cultural importance of this event. Perhaps not. Okay. Uh, so, as a translator, se dice, reflexive verb, goes into a passive. And I get used to that. If there's a reflexive verb in Spanish, my instinct is passive in English. It's an acquired mapping operation. It's one of the ways we learn the language. It's one of the tricks that we bring out. I think in German you would just man sagt. Yeah? One says. But man sagt would be it is said. Or they say. Or something like that. Okay? Uh, so you've got form to form transfer. That's quick. You've got the acquired mapping operations that you've got. And that's quick as well. And, and translators, this is one area you get very good. You build up your repertoire of mapping operations. And you do that through practice. Then you could go from, uh, he's a real lion of a player. Okay, I'm trying to think. Yeah, Suarez got a good goal. Luis Suarez got a nice goal last night. What a lion of a player. Am I saying he's a real lion? Actually, he does, he does bite people. Um, <laughs> I should have selected a better example. <laughs> but, okay, I'm saying, no, he's strong and muscular and, and plays really well. Okay, so the mental process is I go from lying here to the function, the values I want to communicate within the football game that happened last night, and then I regenerate that on the target side into a culture that may not view lions like that, and we might translate it as he was a big, magnificent player, okay, or something similar. Oh, I don't know. In India, he might be an elephant of a player. I don't know. It doesn't sound very nice, does it? But you can imagine. 
that's another kind of process, okay? And, as I mentioned, these days, one of the translation processes we have to accept is post-editing empty output. The, and statistical machine translation will give you form-form transfer, will give you acquired mapping operations, and will give you form-function form. function yeah? form your, your statistical machine translation will use all those methods. Yes? Machine translation. Okay. Auf Deutsch ist das... Machine, yeah, okay, good. No mysteries. Uh, form, form, transfer. Uh, uh, in other languages, automatic translation. Okay. Um, the trick about uh, statistical machine translation is that um, it's based on translations that people have done. You're not getting something from a machine. You're getting something that has been done by humans and stored in a database and is retrieved very quickly. So you can get some quite wonderful solutions from statistical machine translation. Ten years ago, uh, people were using transfer. They would write algorithms, mapping operations, to move between one language and another. And that is more difficult, and it's based on form-form transfer and acquired mapping operations with very little of the third stage. Now, statistical machine translation includes that third stage which is why we can and should use it. Do not tell your teachers that I said that. Okay. But it's, it's there, it's one of the things that happens. Now, which do you use and where depends on two things. One, effort. Time is money, you want good jobs, you want to get rich, that's very clear from your questions. So you economize your effort. You're not going to get there by working very hard. You're going to get there by working elegantly. Do the simpler one, if possible. And the second rule is, if there is no significant difference between the two or three or four options, then pick any one. It doesn't matter. If there's no difference between any one will do, do not waste time thinking about problems you can't solve. Basic rule of life. You've got three possible boyfriends, just pick one. <laughs> we do find that personality plays a role here as well. And the key factor is confidence. If you don't have self-confidence, you will never be able to pick one and get rid of the others. You'll be worrying about the ones you missed. The boyfriends you didn't get. Mm -hmm. Can't go back. Well, sometimes you can, but anyway, that's, that's your problem. Okay. But some people are better at doing this than others, in translation and in life. Making decisions when they're underdetermined, when there's no rules to help you make those decisions, you still have to do it. What I presented last week then, remember this table, was really a set of ways of generating possible solutions. They don't tell you which one to select, they just say, hey, look, you've got a problem. You can solve it by going form to form at the top with copying, or you can solve it by going form, function, form down the bottom. And here are all these different tricks you can use to generate those possible solutions. And uh, that's part of learning it. You can do that. Other people won't have that range of possible solutions. What we can't teach you very easily is how to select which one. Okay? You have to know intuitively that half of them are not going to work. Or in this case, I move up. In this case, I move down. And it can be one sentence to the next. In one sentence, you may use copying. And the next one, you decide you need content change. It really is, it depends on so many factors that we can't teach you rules for that. People asked about very specific problems, which I found intriguing. Because in, I don't know, 25 years of the profession, I haven't really had to deal with these problems very much. I don't know why. Well, they sort of concern non-standard expressions. Uh, people asked, what do you do when you get a dialect to translate? 
Okay, what do we do? We have a novel about London and some characters speak or a strong Cockney dialect, for example. How do you do that in German? I don't know. It's the same problem for archaic language, archaisms. And really, it's the same problem for taboo language, swear words, rude words. Okay, Lots of people asked about that. What do I do when I get Schimpfwörter in my text? Yeah. Okay, well, the, the trap of, in these cases is literalism, of course, um, or pretending, I don't know, that Cockney, the variety called Cockney, uh, you know what Cockney? My mother, my mother, my father, they really like football. We play football. Uh, David Beckham. Uh, oh, I love football. <laughs> okay. All right. That Cockney uh, spoken in the, uh, traditionally in the uh, east of London and now spread out through estuary English around the south of England uh, doesn't map on to any other dialect. It's dangerous to say, oh, Cockney is the same as, I don't know, Schwarzwald dialect or something. That's really, really dangerous. You can play with it, but you risk insulting a lot of people in, in various countries and confusing a lot of readers. Okay? Uh, so the trick for all of these, and, 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 oh, and swear words, is really dangerous because they don't correspond at all. Uh, different cultures have different obsessions. You know, Germanic culture... Uh, should I go there? No, I shouldn't. Should I? <laughs> okay, I mean, Germanic cultures... It's all... Kaka. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I should have gone there, should I? Whereas, okay, do you know what you say in Spanish? No, it's a shite. Coño! Which is a feminine genital organ. I mean, you know, and it's not a strong word. Uh, and then Spanish culture, being very Catholic, has this whole thing about prostitutes in its, in its swear words. <laughs> All right, okay, Spanish people don't translate that for the others. But, and God. Uh, you know, if you you know, talk about God, that is really strong in Spanish. Not so in good Protestant code. Okay, uh, taboo terms depend on your whole culture, particularly religious culture and the sacred that's operating there, and they don't correspond. So don't try literalism unless you're really sure. Uh, it's better to move to the other strategies and you translate the gap from the standard. In all these, in dialects, archaisms, and taboo language, you say, ah, here there is a gap, a divergence between the standard form and the form being used here. Now I'll go over into this culture and look for a similar gap. And you don't translate the thing, you translate the gap, or the divergence, abweichen. Um, it's a lot of work doing that, so you make sure that somebody's going to pay for it. If they don't, don't do it. Um, a colleague, John Milton, in Brazil, did a study of the, a book club. I don't know, I think about 140 novel translations, translations of novels, into Brazilian Portuguese. Charles Dickens, Thackeray, all this stuff. And he discovered that in no case had dialect been rendered as dialect. It was always edited out. It was always made into standard language. And you look around for reasons why. Well, the translators weren't paid to do it. Not paid enough. Number two, the books were used to teach people to read in Portuguese. So the client wanted standard Portuguese for pedagogical purposes. All right? So there are no rules here. Rule number one is, though, don't work hard if they're not going to pay you for it. Ask your client, oh, do you want the dialect rendered as dialect? Good. Plus 20%. Then they say, oh, no, no, it's not really that important. Yeah? Taboo language? What would you like the taboo language? Would you like it strong? Or 
I did have this problem once. Um, it was a story uh, from Australia, Frank Morehouse. Notes from a bush logbook. And in this story, he goes out with his girlfriend into the Australian bush to cook some high cuisine. Okay? And she's attacked by flies, as happens in Australia. You think it's a great place, though. There are lots of flies there, don't you? You can see this is, this is it. Yeah? And the girl says, piss off, you bastards. Now, translate that into Spanish doesn't work. I don't know, into German? Probably not, you know, for flies. So, what do you do? Well, luckily, I was in Barcelona, and I had a neighbor who was about the same age and looks. That's not her, by the way. Okay. And we didn't have enough flies, unfortunately, so we had to pretend with the flies. And I said, pretend you're being attacked by flies, wave them away, and tell me what you would say. Go away, you ugly little things. <laughs> The milk with the flies. Figure out why... Uh, okay, it's milk. It's milk. You figure it out. Why don't they go away for one fisting time? <laughs> there, there's a lot of... I've been looking around for the reasons for this, why there's a fist there. Um, <laughs> there is debate, Okay. Go away, pigs. <laughs> <laughs> well, in English it doesn't work. It suggests that pigs can fly, which is not true. But this is the one that won. I actually did it on three, and this was the one they all said, and the published translation is, go away, pigs. Okay? So we went form, function, form. Uh, a lot of work, but it was fun doing the exercise. <laughs> So when you go to Australia, you go out the up and you forget the aerosol, now you know what to say in Spanish. It's been a pr productive lesson for you. Other theorists have thought otherwise. Uh, Littré, going into French, Littré, a great literary scholar of the 19th century, um, did translate Dante's uh, Inferno, Inferno into Old French to indicate that it's old in Italian and old in, in French as well. Uh, Pézard, uh, in 1950, did the same thing. Um, but Littré argued, for example, that Homo, who is Greek, classical culture, uh, corresponded to the heroic age of Greek culture and the corresponding heroic age in French culture was the 13th century, and so Homo should be rendered into 13th century French. These arguments exist. The translations do exist. They are read and cited. But it's a lot of work. And if nobody's paying you to write in old German or any, the German of any particular century, I suggest you keep it for when you've retired. A lot of questions asked about what quality is in translation, and some were instructive. They said, I do the translation and it doesn't feel the same as the start text. Uh, what can I do about this? And I think I've, I've answered you all. Some of, some of you got long answers, others short answers. Uh, but I think I said, number one, don't feel guilty. That's the first step. Don't feel guilty. I mean, when these languages don't correspond, it's, you didn't do it. You're not responsible for that. You're fighting with centuries and perhaps millennia of separate cultural development. As people have been discussing to form their different identities, they get different shibboleths, passwords, secret codes within each culture, precisely in order to separate them. That's one of the things language does, creates identity. You come in and expect this to map onto that. You're fighting against centuries of human practice. It's going to be hard. And you're not guilty. You do what you can. 
One answer by Christian Anort. What is quality in translation? A translation is good when it fulfills the Auftrag, the instructions. The instructions that for Christian Anort come from the client. If your client asks for this, you do it. If the client asks for an exact translation equivalent, you do it. If the client asks for an adaptation that sells a car, you do it. If the client asks for the swear words to be omitted, you do it. If the client's not going to pay you to translate dialect, you don't do it. Okay? So, it's a very practical rule. Fulfill the mission that you've been given. And that mission will never be to do everything because it's not possible to do everything. Now, I was looking for an Auftrag uh, for actual client's instructions, and there are very few of them. In fact, in 25 years of experience, I don't think I've ever got a clear set of instructions. It's usually, translate this, please. How do you want it done by tomorrow? And that's sort of it. And then I ask, would you like this or this? They say, well, you're the expert, aren't you? I say, all right. If you believe me, I'll... You know, would you like the, the Z or Tu form or things like this? You're the expert. Anyway, this is to translate uh, Vermeer's main text, Hans Vermeer, founder of Skopos theory, the theory that's being applied here. Skopos is purpose. The purpose is expressed in the Auftrag, in the instructions. This is more important than the source text. Hans Vermeer thereby dethroned the source text. But you know this, don't you? Yes, you do now. I've told you now. Right. So, they go to translate him, or they have translated him into English, and they gave a very explicit set of instructions. Well, we're told you're going to go into British English. That's useful. Into English, it's difficult. But, uh, and it's got to be reader-friendly. All right. Would anybody say no? But you must also get his complex, what's it, überlegung, his complex considerations, complex thought, complex things like that, Com complexity, okay? Uh, so you must be both reader-friendly and get the philosophical complexity of this thought. Thank you very much. I mean, okay. This is a good set of instructions because it's telling me do A and do B and if the two contradict each other, good luck. <laughs> you're right, you're right. Which is usually the case. At the end of the day, the client will give you some things that they think they want, um, but at the end of the day, you are the expert because you're the person at what Emma Wagner called the, the word face, like when you're mining. You're the person there with the actual problem and you have to decide when do you go for reader-friendly? When do you go for complex thought? And the instructions are going to help some way, but rarely will they help all the way. And this is in the translation of the great theorist of Skopos theory. Okay? So Skopos theory helps. It helps us feel less guilty. It helps us realize that we're going to sacrifice some things in order to gain others but it's not going to tell us how to apply any rule. At the end of the day, you're on your own making those complex decisions. Quality in industry is a little different. This is, uh, you can't see it, can you? You can't see it if you're at the front. Well done, people at the front. People at the back, that's why you shouldn't sit at the back. Okay. This is the evaluation grid used, is it? Yes, it is. Uh, used by the Localization Industry Standards Association, now defunct, but the grid lives on. And you might be able to see here that you've got a translation project with a project manager, number of words, and under there you have maximum error points allowed. <gasps> You could make mistakes. In 2,116 words, you could make 21 points worth of mistakes. What is this telling us? 
translators make mistakes. Of course you do. We're human. And it's a very complex task. But, for most purposes, they're not important. Under mistakes, you get the level. Critical, plus one. Major, five points. Minor, one point. As long as you're making minor mistakes, things will be fine. If you make a major or a critical mistake, you're in big trouble. And so the art is not to be perfect, because we are imperfect. Don't tell anybody. Outside in the world, they think we produce really good stuff, okay? Here in the kitchen, I know, I make mistakes. You make, we all make mistakes. Make the mistakes on the non-critical things, on the minor parts of the text. If it's a major part of the text, something that's essential for the function of the text, something the client will see, the title, for example, do not make a mistake there. Pay extra attention to the very visible things and the very important things. For the rest, go quickly. Go quickly because time is money. Yeah. This does apply for, for conference interpreters as well. They will intuitively focus their attention on the on the high-risk elements in a, in a discourse and render them and even spend more words on them and omit some of the minor stuff. It's a normal process. So quality is not perfection. The um, thinking in the industry about quality has shifted, therefore, from quality being equivalence to the text, then quality being fulfilling instructions, okay, so from a linguistic notion of quality to a service economy notion of quality, and then quality being a percentage thing, a certain quality being allowed in relation to function. In recent years, though, quality has been related to process, to the way in which the translation has, is done. So we have these... Um, Sta industry standards, especially the 1538, the second one mentioned there, uh, which don't try to tell you how many mistakes can be made, and they don't try to say what the linguistic quality of a text should be. Instead, they say, this is how you should do a translation, and if the process is done correctly, we assume the product will be correct. So, uh, 1358, the second one, says that for any translation company using this standard, each translation should be done by a translator, checked by the translator, and then reviewed by another person. Every translation. And it's assumed that if you get that process of external review, revision is what the translator does, review is what another person does, then the quality will be higher. So we don't try to regulate what actually happens uh, in the text, linguistically. What we regulate is the way your translation is produced. Uh, most thought these days it tends to be on the production process of translations and not on the narrow linguistic quality. Are, are mistakes still there? Of course they're there. By the by, uh, the companies that subscribe to this will declare a, a survey was carried out uh, for the European Masters in Translation project, Optimale, and they asked translation companies, what's the most important thing you require from translators, from you, if you're, if you're interested in that? And they all say accuracy, okay? And then other things like personality, speed, etc., uh, language competence come down on the list. But once you get in the job and working for these people, you become aware that number one is not accuracy. Do you know what it is? Time, speed. Yeah, if you're fast, you're going to get more jobs. Right? You can make some mistakes because often in industry that deadline is more important than the linguistic quality. Uh, so speed is something that has to be acquired as well in today's world. And this goes along with the emphasis on 
process rather than actual product. Another view is um, presented by Daniel Guadec, uh, retired a few years ago, but he trained translators, technical translators uh, in, uh, in Rennes, in France. And his view of translation is this. A project comes in. He, he's dealing with big translation projects done by teams of translators with terminologists, product engineers, desktop publishers, and a project manager. Okay, you're, you're working in a team. No. The project is acquired, and you go through it, and you figure out how many words you got, what kind of words there are, and then you do a pre-transfer analysis. Okay, and you uh, break it up, you get the terminology, the phraseology, you go and get your terminological basis, your phraseological basis, and you write up a series of questions. Would you like this done this way or this done this way? Intimate second person, uh, would you like these terminolo this set of terminology or this set of terminology? And you get all that and you decide that beforehand. Okay, the whole thing is analyzed beforehand. Then you go back to your client and say, for this price, we will do exactly this for you. Agreed? And you sign a contract. It's lots of money. We're talking about big projects, okay? And then, when all that work is done, you do the translation. Nothing under that. The translation is banal because everything has been decided beforehand. The decisions have been made before we get to the actual text. So the transfer operation can be done by humans or by machines. It doesn't matter in theory because all the work has been done prior. We've solved the problems before we get to the actual text. Okay? And then after the transfer phase, which is what we would call the, the decision, uh, the, 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 this translation in the narrow sense, you've got post-transfer where you check it, you review the corrections, as I said, the process here, you do a certain amount of rewriting, you certify that it's all done, you put it back together with the graphs and the images, etc., and you can then have a follow-up or a post-mortem meeting with the client and make sure you get paid. Okay, here, obviously, the whole thing is process. And the approach is, do all the prepar preparations beforehand, discuss it, decide, and then translation is easy. In the, for the rest of us, most of the translation decisions are made as we go through the text, but a big project can be done in this way as well. Um, some people were worried about not getting money. Uh, language service providers that deal with big documentation projects for big companies make lots of money. They employ lots of translators. But most of the money on the team goes to who? Translators, the reviewers, the terminologists. Yeah, you're well paid. Project managers are the people who get the most. Yeah. And most of them in Europe have a background in translation. They started off as translators, they got to see the way these projects work, and they find that they are much happier with a, a mobile phone rather than a computer, and they spend their life phoning people around saying, why didn't you do this on the deadline I need it for tomorrow, etc. High stress, uh, but very well paid jobs. Okay, So there are jobs available, not in translation as you imagine it, but in organizing translation projects. In Monterey, we have a master's in um, localization and uh, translation project management. Okay, we train people to manage projects. It's a job. In Europe, I don't know if there are any masters actually in there. People, you learn it on the job. The people who are there learn it on the job. It's funny, in the United States, the project managers tend to have a background in business. They have an MBA. And they don't care about language, and often they don't know about languages. In Europe, we're, we're much happier because most of them have come up and they have training in translation and they do care about languages. Uh, so the horror stories are, seem to be less frequent on this side of the Atlantic. Is you tend to come in 
and you believe in, in literalism, primitive literalism, or word-for-word -word translation, and you're trying to do that, and then you get the message, oh, we can cheat. We can change things. And you get this phase of great creativity, which has nothing to do with the text. You say, well, it was badly written. I've improved the text. I've, I've done the author a favor. Uh, and then, as trainers, we have to bring you back to earth. Come back, come back, there's a text here. Or your client wants to recognize it as, as a translation. And we bring you back to earth, okay? And there is, I think, that fundamental learning curve. You may be in phase one or phase two. If you're in phase three, welcome to the profession. I've been talking about distributing effort. And I've been talking about some problems being more important than others. So here is what novices tend to do that professionals don't. Professionals invest low effort in solving low-risk problems, bits of the text that are of no importance whatsoever. I do this with translators of the Bible. And I gave a seminar with about 120 Bible consultants, and I presented this, and I say, go away and look at the different books of the Bible in your different language combinations. And a whole lot of them found the most atrocious mistakes in, uh, you know, the Bible where X begat the genealogies, where you could trace the history of the earth of, I don't know, Methuselah begat Solomon begat da, 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 all these things. Okay, the parts that nobody reads, there are mistakes. Nobody checked them. Doesn't matter. Nothing. Nobody calculates the age of the earth anymore on the basis of the generations in the Bible. On the other hand, the key passages. One of them that I like are the two passages that talk about the Virgin Maria and Virgin Birth. Okay. Lots of different opinions, lots of debate, but mistakes, zero. Everybody worked on that bit. So, it's logical to have low effort in low-risk problems and high effort in high-risk problems. And professionals do this. They distribute their... Uh, novices, on the other hand, are given to using low effort for high-risk problems. That's called guessing, or not working enough. And if you're guessing, there's a good chance you'll be wrong and make a mistake. And if it's a high-risk problem, you shouldn't do it. You should do a bit more research or ask someone you know, to, to solve the problem. The other thing we have to avoid is working too much high effort on low-risk problems. If it's not important in the text, do not waste time on it. Go through it quickly. Except, ladies and gentlemen, when it's for your translation exam. <laughs> because your examiner will think everything is important. Okay? And in the exam, therefore, everything is important. But outside in the real world, we don't do exams every day of the week. Don't, you know, if they fail, you do, don't say, oh, but it's not my fault. You know? I'm just, this is for real life. How can you train people in these skills? The skills are making complex decisions, having the competence to do it, generating the range of possible solutions, and doing this with speed. Okay? How can you do it? Well, basically... You translate and interpret. Practice is there. But there are tricks. There are tricks that we can use here that don't happen when you're out in industry. And here's what I think the tricks are. And this is why there are programs for training professionals. One of them is this. To train simultaneous interpreters, conference interpreters, they could spend a semester or two doing consecutive and then simultaneous. Why? Because consecutive is used a lot in the industry? No, it's not. 
A lot of work is simultaneous. Very little is consecutive these days. It's for pedagogical reasons. If you're doing consecutive interpreting, you get used to reducing messages by about a third. You get used to having a synthetic language processing uh, capacity, and you get used to that sort of high-level mapping operation. You get away from the details of language, and you get to the big things that structure discourse. Okay? That's why consec comes before simul. Guadec, the man I mentioned, who has this project manager, this model of extensive detailed translation process, Guadec makes his students write praises, write summaries for the first year. And then, if they're good at that, then they can translate. Same reason. Move away from the literalism, move away from the word, get to the bigger things and the things that count in a text. When you have that skill, now you can translate. Okay? And this is one way of speeding up the learning process by focusing on the skills that you should have and others don't have. And other skills come through role-playing, but you can only do this in small groups. Uh, but it, it's very instructive to get students in groups and get one person to be the mediator between others, especially if you have different languages where people really don't know what's on the other side. And very quickly you learn that half of the, the art is not in getting the exact words there, but in getting these people to understand what they're talking about. That is, the big things are more important than the little things. But that happens automatically when you're speaking as a mediator and you're between real people. Uh, so these are things that can and should be done in small groups. And then you, you, you videotape it and go back and look and analyze what's happening, when it goes wrong, why did it go wrong. I get my students to review each other a lot. That is, instead, before they hand me a translation, they review each other. They correct or revise each other. This is great because I get less things to correct, and I'm happier. Uh, it's also good for them because they learn how to review and how to revise, which is one of the main skills in demand on, in the market for written translation. Okay? So correct each other, read each other, work with pairs, work in tandem. And other exercises can be done uh, pedagogically. If you think that the purpose, the scopos, is more important than the text, this is scopos theory, okay, then you can give students one text and I'll say, people over there translated for that purpose, people over there translated for that purpose. I might get from there's text and say, you guys make it reader friendly, you guys make it complex and demonstrate to people that there are differences and that the choice you make between those alternatives does depend, in some cases, on the purpose. Unfortunately, when I carry this experiment out, it only works for really, really different purposes. For many cases, there, there are no significant differences. And um, other teaching tricks that you do not get in industry you can get actual translations that are done by professionals and criticize them, analyze them. Uh, think about how it's been done well, but also how it hasn't been done well. You will always find mistakes in even the greatest translators, and you'll feel good when you locate those mistakes. But they probably won't be in key high-risk areas. Some people asked, what theory do I need to translate well? Some people ask, what theory do I need to get a good job? Not directly, but I mean, that's what I was understanding. Okay, here's, this is me. I've written a book on translation theories for a course in translation theory. I'll teach you a course in translation theory if you want. I think I've read more Western translation theories than most people would ever want to in their life. You don't need any of them. Shh, don't tell. You don't need any of them. 
Problems are solved in practice. Problems are solved by solving them and repeating them and trial and error and you find what works and then you go over and apply it again when you've discovered that. A theory that pretends to give you rules for solving these problems is pretending falsely, is leading you down a blind alley. The only theory you need is the theory I just gave you. 